light on your feet. I think we will all be happier in here today. And I expect that we'll be here again next week. I checked the weather, it's supposed to rain one time, but if this monsoon and Santa Ana combination stay, we'll need to be cool. So we'll just play it by ear, probably two weeks in here, and uh, uh, maybe we'll even leave the chairs up. But I'm sure glad to see you because we are the people who got together in this place. It's not the place, it's the people, and it's the reason is the Lord. A couple of announcements you should see on your bulletin. Um, two weeks from today, there is a fellowship luncheon. And so um, sign up at the back. Rose is putting it together. But what we'll do after second service is share a meal, break bread. That will be wonderful. Uh, next week, I will be gone. I'll be in Arkansas visiting a friend. And uh, Reverend, Al Dr. Reverend Dr. Alan Duell will be here and he'll be preaching to you. He enjoys being with you as you have. So um, that's next week. And I think that that's pretty well taken care of. I love the blast. I appreciate Tommy for sharing all the news with us. And do stay tuned or give us a call and we'll try to keep you up on things. So now let us prepare our hearts and worship the Lord.
Holy One, who covers us with grace. Great God of all creation, we cannot grasp your love for us. For it is our to do that love and forgiving. We become entangled by our own needs and desires and fail to see beyond anything but our little circles. Please help us to see as you see. In your mercy, O God, forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. For the now the assurance of heart. Friends, hear the good news and believe. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's all sit down. We have a special, a few special things to do today. It is Labor Day, the beginning of a new year in the church, even though it's not our liturgical year. Of course, it's when we all get our schedules full, right? And so our choir has been off, and they are back for the coming school year. And it's time for us to commission them. Psalm 96 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among the people. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Chula Vista Presbyterian Choir, you are being sent as representatives of Jesus Christ and of our church. We are grateful for that, and we commission you together. Let's pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us by your Holy Spirit. You are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading this choir in this time and this place. Strengthen them and use them to proclaim your love as they proclaim your love in song and deed. Establish them in your truth. Guide them by your spirit and grow in them faith hope and love as disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. You are now commissioned to be gifted workers and missionaries of the Lord in music during this coming year. Whatever you do, give thanks to God through him.
Lord, we thank you for the many gifts you give us, for music and song, for service, and for these offerings. Use them all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There are different gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving them, but it's the same Lord who serves them. God works through different people in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. And together we are the body of Christ, individually members of him. And so we invite Carol Crossman and Nan Rathbun to come forward. There she is in the choir. Representing the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the session of Chula Vista Presbyterian Church would like to now install Carol Crossman and Nan Rathbun to the office of deacon. So there are a few questions. Many of you have heard these before, but we are so excited that these two have answered the call to serve in the service of caring and commitment and community. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledging the Lord of all and head of the church, through him believing in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our Presbyterian Church and authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? Will you be instructed and led by them as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among colleagues in ministry, working with them and subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for reconciliation in the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, Accept these persons as deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? We do. All right. We are still kind of distancing, but if you would where you are, just raise your hand towards these two as our installation. This is kind of the fun part. We look a little bit uh, more spirit-filled than average Presbyterians. And we will pray for these people in their ministry. Let's pray. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Carol and Nan, that they may be faithful deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they will see and serve wherever there is a need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they would express the compassion of Christ for the poor, the friendless, the sick, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into halls of power and to communicate your presence and might among all. In everything, give them the mind of Christ who did not grasp at greatness but emptied himself to become a servant. And give them joy in their walk of faith, a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work in ministry. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, you are now installed deacons, class of 2025, uh, and this church, in this congregation, and in the wider Church of Jesus Christ. 
Whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God through him. You may have your seats. Finding my papers. All right, we will now prepare ourselves for the hearing of God's word. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of John. It is in the Lord's, what they call the last discourse, where Jesus is meeting with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. He has a lot of instructions to give them. It's that you know, last minute rush before finals. And he has a lot to say to them. He says it in John chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 before he goes to the garden to pray. And this is more than the last discourse. This is actually the first discourse on the Holy Spirit, on the formation of the church, on God's power and work in us and into the world. We have spoken about, um, we've been talking about the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father creator, who gives us purpose and created the whole world with purpose. And we met last week, we talked a little bit about Christ the Son, who is God with us. Uh, we do that every Christmas, but it's never too early to start preaching about um, Christ coming into the world. And then today is the hardest one. Uh, I picked just a couple of the verses, but I encourage you to read the whole thing, not just as Jesus' words, but look for how he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the power he gives us to do the impossible. And so um, we say that if Christ is God with us, uh, the Holy Spirit is God within us. And that is kind of the preference. So uh, this is John 16, beginning at the 12th verse. And Jesus is talking, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And I will say that that word bear them is like if you had to carry a heavy load that you just couldn't carry, you needed help. So he's saying to the disciples, what I want to say to you, you can't, you can't possibly comprehend. You can't lift it up. And so the spirit of truth will come, and he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come haven't yet happened. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no more. And then he goes on to prepare them, not just for his crucifixion, but for his resurrection. Let us pray. Lord, may the meditations of my mouth and those thoughts of all of our hearts be melded by the Holy Spirit to be pleasing to you and instructive and helpful to us. We pray to you, our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. Well, there's been a fad the last couple of years. It's actually probably been for as long as we can remember, but it's catching on with the younger generation. And here is an example. This is a letter that no one knows who wrote, but it is um, quoted in a book called Extraordinary Golf, The Art of the Possible. And I know those of you who are golfers probably heard of it. It was made into a movie. But here is the letter, part of the letter. Dear younger me, I can't play anymore. I tried to swing the club the other day, but my body wouldn't cooperate. The best I can do now is take some walks on the course. It was my favorite game. I played my adult life, thousands of rounds and hours practicing. I guess I had a pretty good time at it, but I wish I'd seen it differently. With all the time I spent playing golf, I never thought I was a real golfer. I never felt I was good enough or belonged out there. Doesn't make much sense since I scored better than average and a lot of people envied me. But I always felt if I'd just be a little better or a little more consistent, I'd be really good. And he goes on, but you get the gist. This is a letter to a younger me. And so um, when I was growing up, my school teachers had us write a letter to our older self. Maybe you did that, but what I liked best in first grade, or what I wanted to be when I grew up. And the idea was that it would come to me later from my parents at graduation, and I would, I would be inspired. But now, things are different. Now people are writing letters to their younger selves, telling them how to do better, or what to do right, what they wish they'd known. And even we as believers have fallen into it, and there's good, good, um, news in a lot of it. We, we do need to learn. Bart Millard, who is in the Christian band Mercy Me, wrote a great song. It's called Dear Younger Me. Where do I start if I could tell you everything I've learned so far? Catching on. But his has a different tone, and he reminds them they're redeemed. Well, so here's my uh, pun for the week, my not very funny joke. It goes like this. Some of my children wanted to learn how to drive a stick shift, but they couldn't find a manual. <laughs> and you don't know how true that is, because they looked online. <laughs> There's nowhere online that tells you how to drive a stick. But think about it. That's exactly right. We don't know until we have experience. And experience is a hard teacher, isn't it? Well, Jesus is in this last teaching moment, and his young disciples are about to have an experience of their lives. He has told them over and over he will go to the cross, and they have rejected it. Even Peter says, no more, and even within hours of this conversation, Peter will fight those who come to arrest him. He'll chop off an ear. It's not the plan, Jesus. But Jesus sticks to the plan. He is God, God with us, and he knows it's time for us to grow into new understanding of God. He also knows that he must go to the cross so that he can rise. One doesn't rise from the dead if one doesn't visit and be dead. And so he's preparing them this night for what is to come, and his teaching is all about the Holy Spirit. Now, one great scholar said, it's great to teach about the Holy Spirit, but unless you know the Holy Spirit, it sounds hard to understand. You can't get your arms around it. I know you've probably had many metaphors or examples. I personally like the one of breath. It is the breath of God in us, because you never see breath. And in the language of the people of Abraham, breath and wind were synonymous. Remember, Jesus told uh, Nicodemus when he came to talk that you can't see where the wind goes, but you see what it does. The, bird, the leaves flutter and the birds fly. Well, anyway, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and Jesus has, by example, washed the disciples' feet, told them he will be betrayed, and then sent Judas off. He's challenged them to love one another and said, this will be the mark that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Well, what he's really saying here is, I know, it's a lot, and I have so much to cram into your heads, but I really need you to listen now. The Holy Spirit, God within us, is coming, and he will be in my place. It talks, uh, we get the words three times in this section, actually three and a half, but three times you get the full phrase, the comforter. The word could also be translated advocate, as in lawyer or supporter. Um, but it, another way to see it is the teacher, the one who teaches us. And the example I give is, uh, some of you are in the military and know my son told me whenever he was deployed, uh, they have briefings coming and briefings going and briefings in the middle. That's kind of his word for meetings. He grew up Presbyterian and he's like, hey, you got to call it briefings, Mom, more people would come. But <laughs> I kind of doubt that. But anyway, um, when they went to a foreign country or a foreign culture, they had an assigned translator or interpreter. And that person would tell them about the culture and things you should do and not do, things to look out for, so they wouldn't offend the people of that culture. When he was on base, and he told me some great funnies related to that, but when they were on base, it was all good fun. Uh, if they went into a dangerous territory, that interpreter stuck by their side. It was their best friend and, you know, their blankie. That's what the Holy Spirit is for us. He's our interpreter. He translates not just God with us so that we can learn and know God better, but he translates into a hostile and foreign culture that is the world, where there are false teachers everywhere that would grab our attention and cause us to be afraid or unloving or unkind. And so, when Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will come to you, I want you to have the image of an interpreter who goes with us in all situations, both dangerous, frightening, and also desirable, so that we can listen to and be God's people. Uh, the other word that we get in this section is the spirit of truth. So you get the name uh, comforter or you know, interpreter, but then it's always followed by spirit of truth. And that is important because in this passage, he wants us to know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not just perspective or what other people tell us. It's actually God's way of looking at things. Now, there was a study in 2009 in Ohio State they wanted to understand how people looked at things, and so they asked 156 college students to spend five minutes a day reading online magazine articles. They didn't tell them what kind to read, they just recorded whatever they read. Nowadays, I think it might be a lot more than five, but this is a few years ago. The computer they used recorded each the total time that each student looked at spent looking at articles that were controversial like gun control, health care, minimum wage, you know all the hot buttons that we still hear. But the computer recorded how much time they spent on them rather than just have them self-report. And what they learned was as people watched and clicked on things anonymously, their opinions swayed towards whatever they read. Now, you would think that you would choose what you read, but the fact is, whatever you read chooses you. That's the, the outcome of that study. 36% more time was spent reading articles of their own point of view, which then increased their point of view 58%. It more than doubled what they thought. Uh, very few read articles that challenged their own perspective. And the point isn't that this is the world or that one is right or wrong, but the point is we need to spend time reading the Bible, God's Word, because it will guide us into truth, not perspective, not one side or another, but God's truth, because God's truth is more than fact. We understand facts, but as somebody famously said, what we don't know we never know. Facts can be interpreted, 
but God knows it all. And truth is the way God sees things. And the only way to have access to truth is through relationship, give and take, with God. And that comes through the spirit of truth. He is the interpreter, the translator, the one who hears our longings, but also, also tells us of God's great plans for us. He doesn't have a hidden agenda or a spin. You can trust God. And if we listen to God in the quiet of the moment, we will then get a sense, a deep sense of abiding, of God's hand purposefully directing our lives of God's presence with us always. And best of all, of the power that God gives us through the Holy Spirit to change ourselves, which then changes the milieu of the world around us. And we become better people as a result. So back to Christ at the Last Supper. The, you could imagine the disciples saying, well, okay, you have to go, but then we'll just kind of manage ourselves because that's what we've always done, right? And I can see it in myself. I know my day, my scheduled day timer, it manages me. And yet something will pop up and something else will pop up and all of a sudden my day timer's over here and my schedule, my commitments are over here. No wonder we get a little bit stressed or confused. And to add that all, Something will pop up and surprise us and throw the whole thing in a spin. But if we trust and listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can choose wisely what we will spend our time with. And we can prepare ourselves for those things that pop up without letting them knock us over. And Jesus says, this is why I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. He will come alongside and help you, always, forever. Another point is, in this passage, you see this is the rare time when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all mentioned together. It begins with Jesus introducing them, as it were, to the Holy Spirit who will fill them. And it ends with a callback to God the Father who gives and created all things to us. And in the middle, is the point of history. Jesus Christ, the Savior, He is the reason we are saved. And He says, all that I have was given to me by the Father. And all that happens with the Spirit isn't for power or ownership or collection or the things the world gives, but rather to bring glory to God. And that glory draws all people together. We think of glory as praise, or praiseworthy, and it certainly includes that as we spoke about two weeks ago. But it also gives glory to God when we get along. It gives glory to God when we see two people in conversation. Though they may disagree, they, their bodies are open and they can chat and talk. I used to, I had four boys, and they would often fight. And my daughter and I kind of stayed back and watched it. And then I would say to them from Psalm 131, how good and beautiful it is when brothers live together in peace. <laughs> and in our family, that's the code word for, all right, you can stop now. <laughs> well, it was clever. And every now and then I would take a picture of them asleep in the car when they were together or having fun together with big smiles. And then I would put it on the refrigerator with that Bible verse. Naturally, my daughter grew up, and if she ever got in a fight, no one heard about it. But she would point out to them how good and beautiful it is when brothers live together in peace. I love that. It gives glory to God. It's our inside joke, but it's true. If we acted like that, the world would stop and take a second gander. And that's what Christ wants when he says, Love one another. This is how all people will know you're my disciples. He wants us to be role models of healthy relationships in the world. Well, we get that by reading the Bible, of course. And 
one of the important things in this passage is Jesus tells them that the Holy Spirit will tell them about what is yet to come. This is uh, a reference to the fact that they will be the new church. They aren't just Christ's followers anymore. They are his body with different gifts for music and compassion for leadership. Christ's body in the world has power. And the Holy Spirit is the root of that power. In fact, the Holy Spirit inspires them, not just for their lives like in our lives, but to do the amazing things they did in that first century when under terrible persecution and oppression. And it is the Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write his epistles, and James, and John, and Peter. The words of God were inspired by the Holy Spirit as the early church's stories were told. And now, I saw recently a, a short summary of Paul's letters, or they say Paul's epistles. And I kind of laughed because it's so true, and it's still true today. They all start, Paul starts out, grace and peace, prayer. You have a problem? Go to God. By the way, Timothy says hi, bye. That kind of says it, right? Well, you know, I'll cut up, but if you read Corinthians, you know what I'm talking about. And he has beautiful language, and it inspires us, because it's God's word to us, even in our churches today. But there is truth. And the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to these very disciples, and those they would bring to Christ, becomes the base for all our faith in God. And the amazing thing is it doesn't stop there. Yes, God's word is completed. But his word in us continues. As they've said before, you may be the sermon someone needs to hear today. Your life preaches Christ in whatever you do. All right, now that I've laid that heavy trip on you, I will say yes. It's a stone too heavy to bear, as Jesus said. But we as Presbyterians are reserved. We kind of apologize for ourselves because we know the stories out there of that other church, right? And we've been through our own troubles, maybe not in church, maybe in our own lives, but we have to apologize that we aren't perfect. Let me tell you, there was only one person at that dinner that was perfect, and he was crucified. He didn't ask them to be himself. He said, I'm sending you a comforter, an interpreter, he will give you all power to do great things. Listen to him. Grow in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, and you will grow in the knowledge of me, and you will grow in the knowledge of your Creator, your Maker, your purpose. And so the challenge for us is to go to that meal and to not feel apologetic about ourselves or inadequate or small. I mean, there were only 12, right? But rather, to be inspired that God himself has put his spirit in us. And we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. So, one, listen to your Bible. Two, take time in prayer. Oh, and on the Bible, I've said this, but there's a Bible app. If you have trouble sleeping at night, the Bible app will read the Bible to you. And in your quietness, you will hear things that may be helpful in the days to come. Trust me, the Holy Spirit knows where you've been, he knows where you're going. He uses God's word for your encouragement. And so pray. Pray as you, whatever's on your mind, pray in thanksgiving. Pray in praise and pray for others. And then here's another one is listen to God's community. You know, I love the Presbyterian Church. We have a, a council of elders, a session. We don't have one person that knows it all. Together, we discern God's purpose and God's presence and power in us now. We have a PNC now that is doing just that. Corporately, together, they are listening for God's call for Chula Vista now. And I'm so excited for how far they've come. I know it's been long. They've come a long way, and you are going to be somewhere great because corporately, Chula Vista seeks the will of God through the Holy Spirit. 
And then last, I leave you with this. Let the Spirit move in your heart. In the Old Testament, it talks of how people who were moved by God's Spirit danced. Or they did amazing, impossible things against incredible odds. We, too, can inhale, breathe in God's Spirit, and exhale all that burdens us. Uh, as you know, I work with the fire department, and I recently was recertified in CPR. And I was so excited because I almost wanted to preach at all the other firefighters because they have a new machine. Maybe you've heard of it, but it goes around a person who has had their heart stop. They strap it around them. I don't know how, but it gets around them. And it does the pumping. How, how many of you have ever done CPR? It is hard, is it not? You get tired. If you're like me, you start out right, and then you're back. <laughs> and they always say, I'm like, slow down. I'm about to pass. We have little mnemonics to help us. There's a machine that does it right. I don't have to worry about the heartbeat anymore. <laughs> they hook it up. They turn it on. It pumps. But you know what they can't do? The machine cannot breathe. We have to breathe for the person. And it may be through a bag. It may be ourselves. There are different things that help us. But in order to save a life, we have to breathe life into them. Friends, that's the power of God. There's nothing greater than giving the life back. God's Spirit breathed life into you and into me. And in Christ, He saved us, giving us life again. And it is our job, not just to sit there and enjoy it, but to take in that breath and to let God's Holy Spirit give that breath to someone else who may be withering away, not from the heat of the weather, but from the heat of the stress on their life. Not from the worries of the day that drain their blood, but from real spiritual struggles that take their energy. They need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, friends, I encourage you to think of the Holy Spirit as the breath we have in every day. And wherever you go, Breathe in the Lord, breathe out the world. Take that time and get to know God's power for you in the presence of Christ and in the glory and purpose of God for us. Let's pray. Lord God, these are difficult concepts, maybe too difficult for us, even now. We are grateful to have your holy word even your example with the disciples in the church. But mostly, Lord, we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Inspire and interpret for us what great things we can do that you have yet for us to do for you. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. So now let's stand up and stretch, and we will sing together Number 326, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.
You know, on the night before he was betrayed, our Lord had dinner with his disciples. <clears throat> and he gave that meal to us as his disciples in this day and time to follow in the steps of many who have followed him. I love this meal because he gave it to us when we still didn't know what was going on. We trusted. We followed. And yet, he gave this meal to us to introduce the Holy Spirit by whom we are bound in all times and all places, in north and south, east and west, in oppressed countries and in free countries. All through history, God's people have this meal as a promise of the future banquet in the heavenly kingdom. This is the kind of power he has that he wants us to be a part of. This is the kind of purpose that we are called to follow. And this is the presence of Christ with us in our everyday. However humble it is, he is with us. And so I invite you, whether you are a Presbyterian or another denomination, this is Christ's table. If you put your trust in him, you are welcome here. So I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, we lift our hearts to you in thanks and praise. We are so grateful for every breath you give us, for every promise you fulfill, for every hope we hold on to because of you. And in that vein, we remember people who are worse off than us. We pray for them, those who are hungry or needing homes, those who are new to our country, fleeing difficult countries where they are oppressed. We pray for those who have been here a long time yet feel lost and desolate, even forgotten. And we pray for those in other countries such as the Koreas, China, Afghanistan, Russia, Turkey, even Ghana and Kenya, parts of the Middle East and Africa. We know there are so many places where your word is not spoken or not allowed to be read and where people struggle just to live. But they know they have value, and they know in their hearts there is a God who loves them. We pray for them, even though we're far away, by the power of your Spirit, may they be comforted. May there be people who speak to them, missionaries, visitors, even those who serve the good through military or through protection forces. Lord God, we pray for the peace in the world. As our children head back to school, we pray for our own preschool and for all the schools around us in this community and wider. It is good to see getting back to a good, uh, regular routine, and yet we know it is fraught with questions and worries. Give confidence to those who teach that they could get back to the first love of children, of learning, and of seeing people blossom and develop. Lord, this is the call you've given to us. We pray that we would be teachers as you teach us through the Holy Spirit. May we be gentle and kind. May we be open and inquisitive. And may we always be slipping for the good to become the better in those around us. And so, Lord God, we lift up these prayers and many unspoken prayers on our prayer chain and in our hearts. 
We lift them to you and ask you to show us how you would use us to answer those prayers. For we know that you are the answer to all people's questions, all people's prayers. But you may have called us to be the answer to someone else's prayer today. So we commit that to you in the power of your spirit. And in the same way we pray as our Lord Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for it. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. Simple bread. And after that, he broke it, as I ministering in his name do for you. And he said, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat it. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise of my blood shed for you that you would be saved. As long as you and I eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of a risen Lord until he returns. This is the power of God for us. I invite you now to open your package. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. May we all be blessed and a blessing by it. God. And as the early disciples did, so shall we. Let us pray and then sing to his glory. Lord God, we thank you for the nourishment you give us, not just in body, but in mind and in spirit. Go with us now, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Today we are called to be disciples. Amen. 